Welcome back to the i5 Crash Course series. I'm John Stevenson, and in this episode, we are going to jump into a brief history of American space exploration and the future of what the Space Force holds. And don't forget, here at i5, you will learn everything you've ever wanted to know about i5, the Space Force, and of course, how you can be a part of the future. Personally, I'm not a really big history person. I think Ernie actually got a PhD in space history from MIT. Okay, all right, Ernie. I know you, you've been around since the beginning of time, so let me know if I get anything wrong. American to enter space was actually a monkey. Now Ernie usually disagrees about that because he kind of thinks that he was the first mammal to go to space. What, what mammal are you? Back in 1949, the U.S. started to test the effect of spaceflight on mammals. And our lucky little space chimp, Albert the rhesus monkey, became the first vertebrae in space. Unfortunately, he died upon entry back into the Earth's atmosphere, but his contributions towards American space exploration will never be forgotten. About 10 years later, 34th United States President Dwight D. Eisenhower said something along the lines of, hey, we should make an organization that focus on all things space domain. And then boom, all space exploration activities were put under one government agency known as the National Aeronautic and Space Administration, or NASA for short. Oh, oh, okay, so now you're gonna say that you, you founded NASA. You, you, you founded... The creation of NASA sparked a huge space race, as previously, the Soviet Union had launched the satellite Sputnik into space. NASA hit the ground running, constructing technology ranging from satellite creations, like our first satellite, the Explorer 1, to creating technology able to send our first American, Alan Shepard, into space. Newly elected President John F. Kennedy piggybacked off of D.D. Eisenhower to continue our small steps towards an American space presence, being arguably the most influential person in the space effort, creating a dramatic expansion of the U.S. space program. With his goal of landing a man on the moon by the end of the decade, he would have been very proud to know that Neil Armstrong became the first man to walk on the moon back in 1969, closely followed by Eldwin Buzz Aldrin 19 minutes later. No. You are not the first person to walk on the moon. You're not even a person. I don't, what's the freaking head comes off. And we cannot forget Michael Collins, who was a part of the Apollo 11 mission, but did not walk on the moon. In fact, he stayed on the spacecraft and was the first man to see the dark side of the moon, which is the side that the sun is in on if dark side seemed a little too evil. The moon is not good or evil, it's, it's the moon. America's undoubtedly ambitious ambition. Ambitious ambition. Is that, can we, can we say that? Can you have ambitious ambition? America's undoubtedly astonishing ambition led us to look to Mars immediately after this accomplishment with the introduction of NASA's Viking Project, the first US mission to land a spacecraft safely on the surface of Mars and securely return imaging of the Mars surface. Both Viking 1 and Viking 2 lasted way longer than they were expected. They were, I think, supposed to last, I don't know, it was 90 days, right? Yeah, he, he documented all 90 because he was around them. But they ended up lasting years longer than expected. If you've watched the first video of the i5 Crash Course series, you've got to know that satellites do a little bit more than just take pictures, especially the Viking 1 and Viking 2. They were involved in three different biological experiments, each finding potential evidence of microorganisms on Mars due to the enigmatic and chemical acidity of the solid. In 1972, NASA's Pioneer space probe was shot into space, becoming the first artificial object to achieve the escape velocity required to leave the solar system. Before its destination of, well, out of this world. <laughs> It took a pit stop around Jupiter, becoming the first ever mission to Jupiter. But eventually, after being about 10 billion kilometers away from Earth, radio communications were lost, closely followed by a loss of electrical power to its transmitter. 
it is still probably floating around in outer space to this day. Now NASA took a pause at looking towards outer space and started looking towards our sun, which I'm assuming is for me just as bright as this light. NASA's Mariner 10 mission was the first mission to get a close-up photo of Venus taken. It used an ultraviolet filter. In 1984, Ronald Reagan announced the Teacher in Space Project, a NASA project meant to honor teachers while also meant to inspire students about STEM and space. Over 11,000 teachers applied, and of that pool, Krista McAuliffe was selected to not only go to space, but also to teach in space. However, on January 28, 1986, the space shuttle Challenger, 73 seconds after liftoff, exploded. All communications with the crew were lost, and minutes later, following the explosion, all seven crew members, including school teacher Krista McAuliffe, had died upon impact after hitting the water at over 200 miles an hour. Many Americans watched in horror at this event, and it shook NASA and the country as a whole. McAuliffe had been the first civilian who tried to go to space. The Challenger accident would be used as a case study for many different topics such as engineering safety, the ethics of whistleblowing, communications, and group decision making as well as the negative effects of groupthink. The air temperature that day was a record low for a space shuttle to launch, forecasted to drop to be negative three degrees Celsius at the time of launch that morning at 9.38 a.m. The launch was initially delayed an hour for more ice to melt, and the launch was cleared at 11.38 a.m. with a temperature of two degrees Celsius. There was clear controversy on the decision to launch this rocket among key engineers and management leaders. Over time, America is becoming a lot better at being more informed on when, how and why we should be launching rockets with people into space. Four years later, the Hubble Telescope was shot into space. Now, if you don't know the Hubble Telescope, first off, you should know the Hubble Telescope. Since its launch, it has provided some of the richest source of space photography, but on December 25th, 2021, the $10 billion James Webb Telescope was designed to be the successor of Hubble. Now, I don't really like to say the word replace because James Webb is more of a successor to Hubble. I think they're both operating right now. That could change really, really soon. But here's the key differences between the two. In collaboration with the European Space Agency and the Canadian Space Agency, NASA's James Webb Space Telescope will primarily observe infrared, as the older Hubble can only observe a small portion of the infrared spectrum from about 0.8 to 2.5, but James Webb can see, well, basically the entire infrared spectrum. Now there's a lot more differences about James and a Hubble that we could talk about for days, but we'll just leave it there. I'm pretty sure one looks like a honeycomb though. I kind of like that one. In 1997, NASA's Mars Pathfinder landed carrying a robot rover known as the Sojourner. The Sojourner happens to be the very first rover to operate outside the Earth moon orbit. And of course, we've talked about rovers, we've talked about satellites, we've talked about telescopes, we've talked about spacecraft. But what we haven't talked about yet, and what you cannot forget in American space exploration history and world history, is the International Space Station. With its construction beginning in 1998, this mammoth was constructed by 15 different countries over a decade, starting in 1998 with its first segment being launched to 2001, with the first US lab module added, and lastly in 2008 with the addition of Europe and Japanese labs. The ISS continues to bring the world together in space exploration, but also all exploration. For example, certain proteins in space are constructed into really weird 3D structures that you can only construct in space and they can help to design new drugs and medicines. And uh, this stuff was discovered back in 2013. It's been almost a decade since then. I wonder what amazing things they've done there since then. Now, if you want to learn more about the International Space Station, you have an amazing, amazing tool that you can use. You've probably heard of it here, there, or over yonder. The, it's called the internet. I mean, you can discover anything you want from there and about all of the other things we talk about in this video. So please, Make sure to spend some time researching these things if you're really interested and maybe in the future on i5 you could host a discussion about something really, really interesting about space that you really want to share. Now in the same year of ISS's initiation, the Deep Space One launch. Now me, I'm also, I, I'm, I, I don't know if I, if I had to choose a team between the ISS and the Deep Space One, it'd be really hard to choose. I mean, they're both really interesting. One has people on it and they're doing really cool scientific things, but the other, the other. Now this guy's been collecting some of the best images from up close asteroid and comet encounters to date. Now although we've had all these amazing accomplishments, there will always be the risks of humans exiting 
entering and being in space. Unfortunately, there was another space shuttle tragedy that occurred. It was the Columbia Space Shuttle, and unfortunately, we lost all seven crew members upon entrance into Earth's atmosphere as the shuttle had broken apart minutes before its expected arrival at the Kennedy Space Center. This was the second out of 113 shuttle flights, but that is too, too many. Now, a few years later in 2007, NASA's Dawn mission was launched. Dawn arrived at Vesta, the second largest world in the main asteroid belt, marking the first time we have orbited a body in between Mars and Jupiter. Dawn also orbited Ceres, a dwarf planet that is the largest world in the asteroid belt, making it the first time a dwarf planet has been orbited. Yeah. Pluto has still not been orbited. Now NASA's New Horizons spacecraft, after about 10 years and 3 billion miles of voyage, orbited what we consider to be the farthest thing ever explored by human civilization. Not Pluto, actually, it's a few clicks away from Pluto. I think it's called the MU69, but that is considered the farthest away object that we've explored. Oh, I'm sorry, what's that already? Oh, you, you, you've, you've been to Pluto before. You've just, you've just somehow been to... We're getting a new astronaut. Anyways, now that brings us to now. With current goals of having humans on Mars in the 2030s, more advanced rovers to travel on the Mars surface, robot and AI tech to assist astronauts in space, a 5G space network, brand new space which that can be used in deep space, not to mention really cool telescopes, homes on Mars, traveling light speed, potential alien collaborations, and of course, we cannot forget the sixth branch of the United States military, the Space Force, the possibilities are limitless to what Americans and the world will discover next. Here at I-5, we are dedicated to our quest of space education and exploration, and we are excited to learn, grow, and innovate with you. Ernie, dude, what's, what's going on, man? I thought I told you to keep your head in the game. Come on, we talked about this before, man. We can't have this kind of stuff happen.